Hey everybody, I'm Jody Vance. And I'm George Affleck. And it's time for... Promises, promises, have I got a promise for you. You better keep it. You better keep it. You better keep it. You better keep it. Oh, you know, we've already started uh, the silly season for promises in this election campaign in 2022 for B- for Vancouver. I, it's like 18 months and we've got camp, you know, people making promises already. So that's what your column is about? <laughs> My column for Vancouver Awesome this week is about promises or empty promises. You know, I think uh, Gregor Robertson's famous uh, promise to end homelessness by 2015 uh, helped him win at least two elections, if not three. Um, and Ken Sims' recent promise with his ABC party, which they hate me calling it, by the way, I got uh, tweeted at saying, don't call us the ABC party. I'm like, well, that's your acronym. Yeah, but we want to, we want to be called a better city. Well, then you should have thought about your acronym <laughs> because in marketing, <laughs> you got to weigh all the different options of how your name comes in. I'm, it's ABC. That's what everybody calls you. So come to terms with it and embrace it. You don't get to pick your nickname. No. They were coming at me because I was calling it the ABC party, which I think is actually can be really, really effective as a name if you work it. Uh, because Especially it's the if you're in politics and yeah. you know it's a whole. Bunch or if of you're making people. promises, you can go. Here are my promises. A. A. We're gonna do this. B. B yeah. We're gonna do this. Exactly. See, you get marketing. We should get. We should get paid for this stuff, George. Oh wait, you do. Yes. You do. You do. Oh, that's um, right. So he so, promised but, to get rid of the park board. That was his big promise this week. Ken Sim. So I'm like, oh, for God's sakes, is this what we're doing now? 18 months out. We talked about that last week because that was right off the hop. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I was, and, and you know what? And full disclosure, like I have uh, met Ken Sim. I did an interview with him. He seems like a nice person. His wife is lovely. They're business people. Um, I was surprised when he came hot out of the gate with, "I'm getting rid of the park board." It's like. But you know better. Like you, you know that that is an empty promise, and and I think therein lies the unspun need here. As a, as an exhausted citizen of the planet, I'm not pleased with the idea of having an 18 month long municipal election run up to an, 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 a municipal. Like we we'll, had we'll get into this, four and a half years, yeah. right? But U.S. politics, we've done that. We've done, you know, a pandemic election here in BC. Everybody's talking about how the federal government's going to the polls. It's like, yeah. we are ex- exhausted by it. But as you've educated me here on the Unspun podcast <laughs> uh, in days past, politicians love it when, the majority of people don't vote because the base, your base is going to turn out, right? Yeah, generally, if uh, it's really hard to get people like there's always this every campaign. Oh, let's get the young vote out. Well, you know, they don't. It's hard to get them out. And you don't know what they're going to do when they come out to vote. So sometimes there is this desire to make to focus on your base, get the base out, get to people, you know, will vote for you out. That's the key to success in politics. Make sure you get the people who actually will vote for you get out and that's not easy that's a whole task in itself and so priority number one get your base out get your people that you know will vote identify your voter and get them out everybody else is kind of gravy and you just try to hope that they'll support you and they'll jump on the bandwagon or whatever um but your priority is the people that you know already support you and to uh, the point of the like-minded politician right like you mentioned last week here that as the number of people uh center right step up collectively and announce that they will be, what is it? Uh, You call them Marky Mark. We got ABC. Yeah, we got, we got ABC and we got MPA. And then Uh you have K Stu over here, the current mayor. K Stu. I mean, we, everybody's got to have a nickname right here. Yeah. That sounds Um, like he's dating, dating somebody there, but uh, yeah. K Stu. Sure. For for the sake of. I had had some K Stu in the weekend. It didn't agree with me. (laughs) <laughs> I'm surprised it was available. Oh, anyway. Um, but if you have, you know, multiple people center right and one person leaning left, um, mm-hmm. doesn't that give power to the person leaning left when this side like splits? Like, don't, don't, don't the policies matter more than the, the, the run? Do you think everybody mm-hmm. runs to the end? Did we learn nothing well, last? Well, that's what's funny about this, you know, Ken Sims park board thing. And I talk about that. And so I, I you know, these promises that we're going to get, they think that that's, you know, that, that will help you 
uh, resonate in a way that to identify you in a way that maybe it makes you unique and becomes your plank as they call it in politics, your plank issues. Yeah. Uh, or another word that's used in politics is wedge issues. These are divisive ideas like bike lanes, very divisive. So therefore a wedge issue, like it just like ah, dig that in. Um, and, you know, go after whoever's pro or con. It's easy to kind of, you know, you know, you've been living it for the last six months, the, the pro and, you know, con bike world. It's very yes. divisive and very wedgy. Um, so, you know, if, if you're a new party, like, like the Marky Mark party and the ABC party, um, you have to raise the issues then that you become, policies are, are become a priority for you because you're, you're not identified by your name or potentially yeah. the person uh, in the way that you would be. So the NPA's brand, and we'll get into that in a second, uh, is strong in Vancouver, no matter what anybody says. And maybe, you know, what is that base? 20,000, 30,000, still there. The 5% of the people that are paying attention to what's going on right now are, are you know, maybe they all change their mind, but there's 95% of the people that vote for the NPA that will just vote for NPA. And, you know, I think that's what uh, certainly John Cooper is banking on and the NPA are so banking let's, on. So let's get into it. I mean, that was big news. I mean, I, I called you like I got called in to work for Jill Bennett uh, on Wednesday, depending on when you're watching this. And it was two o'clock breaking news. Uh, big shake up municipal politics. You joined me at two five zero. We pulled you out of a meeting so you could come in and talk about it because I really wanted your perspective on three NPA councillors, three of the four female mm-hmm. NPA councillors. Um Deciding to leave the party and sit as independents, uh, will you lay it out? What happened? What did you see happen? Well, I mean, we had, we talked about this. This was comes as a result of John Cooper and the board making a backroom decision to make John the candidate as mayor for the NPA. It came out of nowhere. It came a few months early. Uh, surprising. All those things. Uh, obviously, he's a white dude. Uh, the caucus uh, elected to council all women. It was really impressive that NPA, we did that, you know, that, that in Vancouver, that we as an electorate voted a majority of women on council, um, which is astounding and great. And uh, so, but they decided that uh, this backroom deal was not appropriate, not fair, that, that they were not uh, consulted at all. Uh, they felt that the board, they, you know, they've talked about the board being uh, too far right and, and full of people they don't like or whatever. Uh, you know, Rebecca Bly left a year ago, um, and now so now the three other the three everybody except for Melissa De Genova have decided. You know, now they they are now sitting as independents, and you know what they will do in the next election is is anybody's best guess. I've kind of tweeted out that saying. You know, Lisa Del Monado was sort of going was going back and forth because I'm saying in the last election in 2018, which I was I had nothing to do with um, with MPA. Uh, there there was. Uh, there was a decision, but the, there was a process uh, to apply and you've got to go through your legal checks and all that stuff. Everybody has to do that. But at the end of the day, the final decision happened in the back room at the 11th hour. And there were people that were thrown under the bus. There were people that were you know, pulled up out of nowhere and became candidates. And I think uh, so, you know, that's and I, I said this on City TV yesterday. I say this all the time. The party process, whether it's the NPA, the BC Liberals, the NDP, the federal liberals, everybody has their process as a party you can decide you can in your governance model you can decide whatever you want your board has the ability to choose that process how that affects the democratic decision of the people when an election time comes is the ultimate question so far you know npa has now lost several elections in a row as far as mayor although for the 2014 election we did win a majority uh across the board as far as all people elected in vancouver we actually had more elected people than any other party that was where uh, Kirk LaPointe was a mayoral candidate, uh, and it was my last election. 2018, Ken Sim was a mayoral candidate, and we lost. We backtracked big time, went backwards uh, on the numbers. Um, and, you know, I think that that showed a weakness on his part as, as the candidate that was selected in a public process. He was, yeah. on, to, to give them credit, there was a public process. And John Cooper, there were three candidates, John Cooper being the other one. Uh, and, you know, the, there was a process there and, and Ken Sim managed to, you know, basically sign up more members. The process was number, number of members first past the post process, you know, whoever signed up most me- members basically and got them to show up to vote at the AGM or at the leadership thing, uh, won. And that's what Ken Sim, he, uh, he signed up more people than John did. I think he got 900, John got 600 and, um, uh, oh my God, I'm totally just blanking on the third. <laughs> Is um, you got 300 or something. So there was not even a second ballot 
Uh, and um, so it, it was a public process. John lost, but uh, and then Ken Sim lost the whole thing in an election. And that was the decision by the voters. And so and, and I think the vote, I think Ken Sim lost because of the process that happened that I think was backroom in the last in 2018, more than any backroom decision I'd have had, had experience with the NPA. Uh, and so because it's part of the reason I wasn't involved in it. I didn't like what happened. And so I didn't help at all with the, the 2018 election. I was I helped Rob McDowell as an independent. I helped Wade Grant as an independent. I helped a few other. I even worked with help. Sarah Bly was uh, driving around in my dad van. Uh, the, before them, we, you know, they were making jokes about using my dad van uh, as independents to run. None of them won. All of them were quality candidates. Didn't have a party, uh, so they all ran as independents um, and didn't win. So that's a that's a statement, by the way, of the future potentially of these other independent candidates. Can they win on their own? I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. Um, and but this is their decision. And by the way, I'm rambling here, I suppose. But you know, this is sort of you know, a lot of inside information, I suppose. I would say that, um, you know, that those three uh, people, you know, the three women that made that decision to leave uh, had also been vocal right out of the gate and, and were disappointed and sent a strongly worded letter to the board saying, you can't do this. Uh, they would have likely gotten a boot anyways. I would say that their, their betrayal at that stage, uh, you just can't have that in party politics. You can't come back from that. And so they knew the writing was on the wall, and so they decided to take action on them on, and, and, and run, you know, push the agenda forward for themselves. And, and that's absolutely legitimate. That's politicians uh, they, politicking. That's politicians yeah, politicking. Yeah, but it's also and they, it, want, be, it's, they want to it's separate the, themselves out. For sure, but I'm, I'm going to step in here as a woman that it does feel to me that it, the we would never say those three male, male NPA members left. There's this real gender identity thing with regard to this particular move and th that just keeps hitting me, not not from you, but just across the board. It's like the women, but we were celebrating the strength of the women on council, mm -hmm. but it's like these three female counselors, it's like, okay, how about these three counselors or these three politicians, these three NPA representatives are now running as independent. I'm just putting it out there. I just want to, I want to change my vernacular as well, because I think that we're grouping them, that we're lumping them together uh, because they are women. And, uh, and I think now as independents, unless they're planning on creating their own party as a, as three politicians in Vancouver, I'd love to hear if that's the case. I'm so busy reading whatever the Georgia Strait. Oh my goodness. The that Charlie's column, the column was, yeah, that was, Char I, would, I suggest anybody read Charlie Smith's column on this. It was. I opening. I mean, uh, was it, was, yeah. was it rooted in, in, in fact and truth? I mean, I'm assuming so. Yeah, I mean, I think most of it is sort of what I'm talking about. Obviously, he put it in a way that was humorous. He used gag me with a spoon, and, man. He I used gag me as a spoon. Or gag me with a spoon. Terminology. But he he raised the point. Hold on. Of, uh, Hold on. That I've, that I've he used valley girl terminology. Very important. Yeah. That the valley reference. Girl, yeah. He didn't use yeah, bre bre breakfast club or, you know. Uh, I don't. I know Charlie's a character for sure, and I, I think that uh, I don't know why he chose that, but it's, it's uh, yeah, that's how he felt. And the picture is identifies his emoji that he used as a gagging, the barfing guy. Yeah. The barfing emoji. Oh no, I'm so, not you know, dissing him for using it. I'm just no, pointing I, I, it out. I, I, I'm just pointing it out. You get the clicks. You get the clicks. Get anyway, the clicks, I think it, it, it basically it was. It's sort of what my point is. I would say that the dis, the, the hypocrisy is absolutely there on 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 the one issue of process. Because I absolutely say that in the last election, there was a process, yes, where you submitted, but and there was a process for the mayor. But at the end of the day, the, the in the back room, the board of directors of the MPA made a decision and picked and choose and kicked out some people and chose other ones for whatever their reasons were. Uh, not to mention, Charlie points out that uh, Sarah Kirby Young's husband uh, sat on the board and was part of that decision process, which is completely inappropriate. And a lot of people vocalized that at the time, saying this is not... Uh, not appropriate uh, because it obviously perception of conflict. I mean, it's absolutely there. Um, even though she absolutely deserved to be a, a candidate in the, in the last election uh, because she'd done hard work on the school uh, count on, on park board and, and, you know, it's an obvious move up. And so. Yeah. Uh, Incredibly hard work. Yeah. I'd like to add so, to that. You know, I, it, uh, there, if I was her, I would have uh, not had my husband on there because I think she still would have been a candidate. I would have solved yeah. any of that backlash. 
So I'm going to just say this, all of that inside baseball, I love it. I personally, I love hearing it from you. You were not rambling at all. I feel like I've learned a little something, but for the voter, what they want to hear right now, anybody who's decided to run for mayor needs to talk about what they're going to do to fix what's messed up in this city. I want to hear and things that they can actually follow through on, not the promises, promises, you know, don't tell me you can do something when you can't. Actually, tell me what you're going to do, what you're going to take action on, what you're going to focus on, what you're running on, what your platform is. Like, if we're going to just go around we'll and around with mud slinging, mud slinging, mud slinging. But I'm telling you, as of, I'm a Vancouver voter, I, I'm a, Van, a vocal Vancouver voter. If somebody steps back from the noise of this and actually tells me how they're going to fix what is clearly messed up in the city and sticks to that, we'll get my vote. I would say so far, the Ken Sim promise about Park 100% of a media play headline grabber, not realistic. Uh, and so far, the things I'm hearing from Mark Marison, which is basically the Yes Party platform, which he was uh, behind and likely yeah. will just rebrand, are similar kinds of things as far as housing and making promises about uh, ending you know, homelessness. Process of homelessness. Development. Well, no, he's, he's talking about massive redevelopment and you know, you know, the you know the very very supply side of, of housing. Um, and it's it's naive. I just know having sat in council for seven years, process matters. And the fact is of the matter is we actually have the, a good solid amount of housing ready for to go in the pipeline to, yeah. to match the volume of people moving to the city. And we just got to remove the red tape from yeah, the permitting houses. office. We just got to yeah, remove yeah, the red houses. tape. Yeah, yeah. Colleen Hard Hardwick is kind of right on this, but what she's wrong at is that, you know, it's to stop doing it, to stop adding more volume to the, just keep, you know, that that's wrong. But the, this, the fact of the matter is we have enough housing in the pipeline, potentially, if we can get rid of all the process, slowness, red tape, yada, yada, yada. That's the challenge of City Hall right now. And that's what any candidate should be talking about. What's that solution look like? Describe that to me. And there are solutions. So it. stop there. Stop there because we're 17 minutes into the podcast and we're still on this one subject. And I want to get to a bunch <laughs> of other subjects before we wrap up. So I'm going mm -hmm. to say that whoever promises whatever, I would hope that they've done their due diligence to see whether or not they can achieve some, most, or all of that promise without deferring to asking others to do it or writing letters about it. So we'll leave that there. Uh, <laughs> let's move on to COVID-19. The UK is uh, your backyard, your your wife's family in the UK. You're now an AstraZeneca. Before I do my British accent that Amanda loves so much. I absolutely I'm not, want I'm not that. Can you do this listen. whole no. next bit in your English accent? Oh Can God. you? She would kill me. She listens, of do course. It. And, uh, of course. No. No, go no governor. I'm not going to do nope. it. No, no, <laughs> no, no. She would literally kill me. She thinks okay, my there's... accent is an insult to British people. Oh, uh, geez. Yes. No, there was a good story. Tell us. I yeah, tweeted, tell us. Tweeted out so that, that you know, I, I have the AstraZeneca pumping through my blood now. Um, she got her shot actually this week, the AstraZeneca, because uh, she's 40 plus. I am a little older than that. So she got she got locked in and got that done. Um, Love it. So the, the report came out of London or England today, the UK, they're down to basically, they think zero, zero deaths. They can't really, they have a different way of tracking their data. So they actually include a whole bunch of stuff post, you know, they, so their data is a bit skewed, but they are saying zero deaths, averaging right now, 900 cases, new cases per day. That's the same as BC and they have yeah. 70 million people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they've, they've knocked this thing to, to the, to the level we'd love to see. Um, using AstraZeneca. And I, so I think Let's it's a it. testament to, to and they don't have age restrictions. They're just, everybody gets it. Anybody who wants it gets it. They also have the other ones, but AstraZeneca has been the dominant. They do have, they're not vaccine. vaccinating children in the UK though. No. No. So no, a, age restrictions, it's 18 plus yeah, yeah, for I mean, AstraZeneca, plus. Yeah. which is, which is, you know, and the real world data from there is important. I'll get to that when I hit my column, when it comes to real world data and AstraZeneca and how really the UK is an example of, we are in the end game now. Uh, talking yeah. about travel and COVID-19, I'm not sure if you saw the story out of India. There was one that was posted that literally came with a warning. Uh, it is something that everybody should watch because when you're thinking that, oh, we're doing such a crappy job here in BC and oh, we can't believe that, that, that and what we see going on in Ontario and, and we'll get to Doug Ford in a minute, minute but what is happening in India is Stunning and terrifying. Today, yeah. A day, a day. Yeah, and they're running out of oxygen and people are 
are, are scrambling to try and find remdesivir, like anything, anything to help to try and stop right. the severe illness. So, you know, while we, we are frustrated with, um, you know, our, our slowness to the role in Canada when it comes to vaccinations and what have you, and it is very scary to see what's happening in Ontario and it feels awful and overwhelming our healthcare and all of those things, all of the things we've talked about for more than a year now, we need to be mindful of what it looks like in India right now, what it looked like in Italy when it shut down, what it looked like in the UK well, for a while there, what it looked like in, in Wuhan, China. Like nobody is immune here. And the anti-maskers and the anti-vaxxers need to sit down because we need to protect each other while we get to this end game. And, and, and here we are with proof that vaccines are effective. Can you imagine, George, if we had nothing? If we were going to go years of this and watch it flow and ebb and kill and do and, you know, it's just... It's a lot, which brings us to the Doug Ford piece of the puzzle, because we can get into the how do you stop travel from India? There are a bunch of people on my Twitter right now going, are we still having flights land and why VR from India? It's like people travel around the planet in ways that shutting down one route is not going to fix. People land in New York, get on a different plane and land in YVR. They land in Toronto. They land in uh, in in Chicago. When you land, you get the two weeks isolation. You're required to do that. So. If they're not doing that, that's a problem. Um, and obviously, this yeah, there's sure. a lot of but a federal problem right now about this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. And and but it comes down to we all know the biggest transmission is just basically our networks, right? That's what we're seeing. We're still yep. seeing that as a problem. And we've done a pretty good job in BC. You know, you we've talked about this. You're you're way stricter than I am, but I'm not as loose as the people at Kitts Beach. But even then, I'm going okay. You know, they're outside. They're outside. Even then, if you watch Bill yep. Maher last week, he went on a rant about this. Like, come on, you know. Uh, Texas and you know Florida are, are doing great, and they're totally loosened up on the outside stuff. Um, so I, I don't know. It's like you don't want to be too fascistic when it comes yeah. to this because it just turn, it starts to work against you. And and, it and does. Doug Ford. Well, saw look that at Doug Ford. Too. Doug Ford definitely. I mean, he apologized. Not sure people saw it today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He and apologized was, this morning. Looked like he was going to cry. That was his political instincts working uh, instead of following the science. He made a decision, as we heard from the scientists who came out vocally, which was surprising, very much like yeah. the Trump days a little bit where you had, you know, this counter, you know, this the two two messages happening, which is never good. Um, you know, that there is a you got to commit to the let the let the scientists do their thing. Uh, you know, which has happened in BC. BC. Can we just point that yeah. out? Like that has yeah, happened well, I, here. I mean, you know, Adrian Dix, and, and it's funny because, you know, I've heard a story. Adrian Dix and Raymond Horgan have known each other for like 30, 40 years. And they're old buddies, right? Matter of and confidence. So, you know, have you not read A Matter of Confidence? Yeah, Rob yeah, Shaw and Richard well, Zussman's book? That's right. Come on. That's right. So, that book is, no, but lays it all but, out. Yeah, my point is that, that there's this trust that they have with each other, yeah. right? There's also yeah. Horgan doesn't have to wear the, if anything goes badly, he doesn't, he doesn't have to wear it. And actually, so far, every time he comes to the mic, he does something wrong. He's like, dude, get your data right. Get your facts right. We're going to have police everywhere. Oh, actually, no, we're not. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think L- that, Let's talk uh, about that because we are running, we're running yeah. tight for time and travel local in travel. BC, local travel in B- British Columbia, more restrictions coming, depending on when you're watching this, we're Thursday. So coming on a Friday um, to talk about how between Friday and the end of the May long weekend, there goes no my travel outside of your birthday present for Amanda, by the way, on May 6th. We were supposed to meet. We were supposed to meet. Um, you can't travel. Out. I found it really weird to say outside of your health authority. Because technically, yeah, was... in Vancouver, I can go to Whistler. Because <laughs> we're in the same. But the message is, don't leave. If you live in North Van, don't leave North Van. Well, if you live in Vancouver, don't leave Vancouver. Why did they say health authority? Why didn't they just say your community? Don't. Well, how about your city boundaries? Unless you work and you essential. People are talking like, we don't know what essential means. It's like, yes, you do. I don't yes, understand. You do. How, why is this so complicated to people? It's not. It's I don't not. understand it. I go home. I go to work. I go home. I go to work. That's about it. I go, we get groceries. We usually walk to get our groceries or we have them yeah. delivered now, which is great. And, uh, and we know I have a couple of clients that are in Richmond. So, you know, we, we've, you know, one's a mall. So I gotta, you know, we go there to do stuff. Um, yeah. so it's, 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 uh, you know, you, but it's not it's, hard. We're, we're, we're logical. We're just like, be logical. Like just five weeks, don't dude. Leave. Don't do your stuff. If you don't have to do it, like if don't you have do to your... do it, then do it, but d- d- don't do it. If you don't have to do it, I don't know what, how much more simple can it be? It is that simple. It is just that simple. And in the meantime and in between times, take the shot you're offered. 
This AstraZeneca move to 40 plus, as you said, uh, Amanda getting her shot. So many of my friends are just like, it's in there. 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 So I will say, you know, Amanda cried, by the way, I was there with her and it was because I was all I was elated when I got mine. She, I shouldn't probably, she's probably mad at me now for telling us. No, I'll tell her, her I'll tell her this. I also cried. So, and I was in January feeling very alone. (laughs) No, Quinn and I were like, what happened? Didn't you get it? She came out and she started crying. We're like, oh my God, didn't, you didn't get it? What happened? Did, did, they, did they refuse you? And she was like, no, I'm, just, I'm happy. So I want to, um, we haven't even said, if you're following along on Twitter, it's George. Underscore. Affleck and at Jody with a Y Vance. The Orca.ca is likely where you're uh, listening to or watching this from. Uh, the Orca.ca is where you'll also find my column. Drops on a Wednesday. And this week, uh, couple of things that I just want to touch on to the person who is like, yeah, I'm not sure about AstraZeneca. I'm going to wait for the efficacy of Pfizer or Moderna. Um, Don't. Um, I loved what Dr. Henry said. Yes, you can hate me for really respecting the scientists. I'm going to continue to trust her. Uh, Maybe it's because we're the same age. I don't know. But she's said in as many words on Monday that the risks associated with the very, very rare blood clot syndrome with associated with AstraZeneca is four in one million. And most of those four in one million, completely treatable and recovered, by the way. The risk in British Columbia of contracting COVID-19 right now is four in 100. Yeah. Okay. So let's just let that sit in four in 100 or four in a million. Take your AstraZeneca shot, stay tight for two weeks. And the efficacy doesn't matter. 70%, 90%, whatever. All of the vaccines give you zero chance of severe illness, zero chance of hospitalization and zero chance of death. So that's the only numbers you really need. And in my column, I dive into that and how can you ever remember a time where you were going for a vaccine and you said, what pharmacy, what, what pharmaceutical company is this from? Or Never. even taking an aspirin, for God's sakes. I mean, do you ever think about that? Or, I mean, come on. I mean, we, de- we don't even, you know, I'll Benelin versus this. I don't know. What's the difference? No. Like, we'll stop my cough? Good. I'm buying that one. Exactly. It's such a bizarre world. And, and by the way, regular vaccines, and I think I pointed this out, the ones we get for flu every year, 30%. Efficacy. You do. Efficacy. Efficacy is a garbage term that everybody has claimed all of a sudden. And I have friends who will remain nameless who are like, yeah. mm." So I'm going to say that everybody who hesitates on vaccination is making this longer because we are in the end game now. Do you love a Marvel Marvel film? Do you love a Marvel film? Do you watch them? No. No. Okay. So I'm obsessed with Marvel. I have kids. Okay. Right. So you watched Endgame. So you remember that moment where Doctor Strange puts up his finger and says, we're in the Endgame now. That's where we are. (laughs) That is where we are in this pandemic. If we, there's 14 million ways this could end. Cumberbatch, thank you. Do do it as your Benjamin Cumberbatch imitation. (laughs) You should do it. it. No. Okay. One more point that I want to make on on, on my By the way, just so you know, we had, we had, we had two budgets this week, but <laughs> we did. We don't have time for talking about that. We'll get to that next week because this is really important for those who find themselves in a situation where their significant other is an anti-vaxxer or their significant other is controlling or abusive and will not let them be vaccinated. Being able to get your vaccine at your local pharmacy makes it exponentially easier for you to just go get your vaccine and don't tell anybody. You don't need to post a selfie. You don't even need to keep the little sticker on your shoulder. Go to the pharmacy. And if you are in in an unfortunate and abusive situation or a controlling situation, tell the pharmacist that. Say, I've got five minutes and I need that vaccine today because I'm here for milk. And I bet you that the pharmacist We'll do that for you. It's one of those things when I did the government survey that's buried in all of their questions is checking to see if you're in a scenario wow. that you can't get out of. So just just let that be a piece of unspun that, that we push out there in the middle of the table to help maybe one person. Absolutely. Good info. Next week, budgets. Next week, budgets buried, and saving the p Buried in the news. Oh, and buried in the buried in the news. Oh, and the P&E. Save the P&E. Okay. Disney's oh. going to buy it? Is Disney buying it? No. I've got... Uh, no, there's something in the... There's a line in the budget. I got breaking news. Okay. Have you you've been watching on Twitter where people get all mad at me and Keith Baldry and... 
Justin McElroy. Yeah. And okay, so guess what I got made? This is this is being mailed to Keith Baldry. So if he gets it, and this is for, sees uh, this... Uh, for audio listeners, we will describe what it is. Okay, what is it? Team Baldry. Oh, Hashtag God. Team Baldry, baby. Uh, what if I say I'm team, uh, <laughs> team. Pick one. Baldry. I'll get you one made. Team what? Team Baldry. Team Baldry. I'm team Zussman. Team, team, team McElroy. Vol- Are you busy? Team, team Von Palm? But, but that's hard to say. Team Palmer. Well, it, won't fit, it won't fit in a hat. So I won't get it. I, don't I wear bet a hat. I could get you, it You don't made. want to see me. You don't know. I don't wear hats. You don't want to see this giant face on, with a hat on. No. Nice. Team Baldry. Hashtag. <laughs> All right, on that note... It's a, it's a running joke. We got to go. See you next week. Bye.